1900, he gave an interview to Robert Spencer, an architect, and he talked about the symbology of these panels. Knowledge derives from the understanding of nature. With the understanding of nature, wisdom and fertility, which is the symbolism of the storks, I create my architecture. So this is what he presents. Frank Lloyd Wright is one of the most influential figures in Chicago architecture because his work motivated modern builders. He shaped the Chicagoland area and gave America its own style of architecture. People may disagree with the idea of Wright being an inspiration to builders today, but his organic architectural style is still seen in modern homes. When most people think of Frank Lloyd Wright, they are probably contemplating his finest works, such as Taliesin, Falling Water, Guggenheim Museum, Johnson Wax Headquarters, Imperial Hotel, Larkin Administration Building, Unity Temple, or any other of his most famous creations. Those that knew Frank Lloyd Wright knew him as a charming, self-promoting, restless, arrogant, overbearing exaggerator. According to Daniela Blanco and Rita Williams of the Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Studio, Wright had five influences, nature, music, Japanese prints, Louis Sullivan, and Froebel blocks. Frank Lloyd Wright, formerly known as Frank Lincoln Wright, was born June 8, 1867 in Richland Center, Wisconsin. His mother encouraged him to become a builder, buying him Froebel blocks to stir his inner architect early. In 1886, Wright took architectural classes at the University of Wisconsin. He left the school, taking no degree, and fled to Chicago, telling no one of his plans to leave. Desperately looking for work, he was hired as a draftsman with the architectural firm of Joseph Lyman Silsby. This did not last long, for he had other plans. In 1887, Wright had taken an apprenticeship with Louis Sullivan, the man often credited for the first skyscrapers. In no time, Wright was promoted to chief draftsman and was in charge of 49 other men. Wright was an ambitious man and began designing houses for wealthy clients behind Sullivan's back. For these projects, Wright used an assumed name. In 1893, Sullivan discovered this and fired Wright from the firm. In the meantime of his career, Wright had met Catherine Tobin, a lovely woman whom Wright decided to marry. Together they had six children, four boys and two girls. Wright began his own firm, wanting to create a purely American style of architecture. He was the first to use the architectural styles of Britain, Vienna, and Japan all in one. This combination aided in shaping his famous prairie style. Prairie houses are set back from the road to provide privacy, intimacy, and security. Prairie style relies heavily on horizontal lines, low-pitched roofing, overhanging eaves, a central chimney, and open floor plans. The whole first floor is one room, usually with large, clustery windows. Most of the interior lighting was provided by these large windows. Wright wanted these homes to be in tune with nature, and some referred to his style as organic. Prairie style was a singularly American creation. Wright was overbearing, and to live in a house he had built, you must live with every choice he had made for you. Wright insisted on furnishing homes he built and would scold homeowners for moving the furniture around. After some of Wright's first prairie-style homes, business was booming. Between 1900 and 1909, Wright had built 135 houses in the suburbs around Chicago. In 1902, Wright was asked to build the Larkin Administration Building. This was Wright's first large-scale project. As per usual, he went over budget. Despite this, it was a masterpiece. The windows, doors, and skylights were made of glass to ensure opportunity for natural lighting. Magnesite was used for sound absorption and sculptural decoration. Wright designed most of the furniture that went into the building. There were 14 sets of three inspirational words along the walls in between support piers. In 1905, Wright was asked to build a church. This became Unity Temple. The exterior is considered quite plain, institution-like, with its rows of supporting columns. The interior is said to give you a floating experience because the center floor is raised. To be seated in the pews, one must walk up a small set of steps located on either side. The seating is configured to unify your view not only of the preacher, but of the total congregation. This is what gives the temple its name. In 1911, Taliesin was built in Spring Green, Wisconsin. This was Wright's home he built for him and his mistress, Martha Mama Borthwick, a married woman. Taliesin means shining brow. Wright named his building this because he built it on the brow of a hill. Wright thought it a sin to build on top of a hill, saying, No house should ever be on a hill or on anything. It should be of the hill, belonging to it. Hill and house should live together, each the happier for the other. Taliesin was Wright's very own prairie-style home. Wright was in Tokyo for six years, building what would become the famous Imperial Hotel. 
This hotel mixed Western style and Japanese style architecture. The main building materials are poured concrete, concrete block, and carved Oya stone. It was finished in 1923. Soon after, an earthquake shook the city, knocking down most buildings. Yet, the Imperial Hotel survived and became legend. In 1932, Wright started a Taliesin apprenticeship. There was an entrance fee of $600, and the students were required to put in four hours of manual labor a day, working on Taliesin. This apprenticeship became the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. In 1934, Wright was asked to do Falling Water in Mill Run, Pennsylvania which is, arguably, his most famous work. His client, Mr. Kaufman, had called him and told him he was on his way to Taliesin to look at the blueprints for falling water and would be there within three hours. Wright had said to come, despite that in the three months that he had time to work on it, he had not a single draft. In under three hours, Wright completed the blueprints for falling water, exemplifying that he and Mozart had much in common. In Mozart's later years, he was deaf, yet he still composed music because he knew how it sounded already. Wright would not draft anything until he was certain about how he wanted it to look. He had contemplated falling water over the course of three months and took only roughly two hours to map it out perfectly. They were both masters of their crafts. Wright had a contempt for modernism and did not favor the use of a flat roof for a home. Yet for falling water, Wright uses flat roofing. Many believe this is because Wright knew if that flat roofing was to become popular, it would be because he had used it. Falling water is a masterpiece. In the drafting of this home, Wright had his associates map out every tree, every rock, so that all would be accounted for in the blueprints. Wright was challenged with this house. The Kaufman family wished for this house to be built near Bear Run, a river. In the completed home, there is an overhang that hovers above the water. He considered his buildings to be his concertos, and falling water was his opus. Wright was again challenged with a mission, to make a home for the common man that costed no more than $5,000. Usonian is a term used for these homes built in the 60s for middle-class families. This design began with the Jacobs House, built in 1936. These homes were typically small, single-story, and without a garage. They were often L-shaped to fit around a garden or the landscape. They were built with native materials, as per usual of Wright's work. They used flat roofs and large cantilevered overhangs for solar heating, natural cooling, and natural lighting. These homes usually had a carport, which was an overhang for a parked vehicle. Carports were then used commonly, even outside of Wright's work. Wright was never able to keep the price under $5,000, yet he had envisioned a world where the Usonian home was the regular. In 1936, Wright built the Johnson Wax headquarters. The blueprints took 10 days to complete. The budget was overshot completely. Herbert F. Johnson having later said, first he was working for me, then we were working together, and then I was working for him. The construction of the Johnson Wax headquarters caused issues for Wright. He envisioned these great columns that were 9 inches in diameter at the bottom and 18 feet in diameter at the top with a round platform Wright called lily pads. The difference in diameter at the top and the bottom of the column did not comply to the architectural codes at the time. Wright was insulted that the building inspectors thought these columns would not hold the ceiling. Wright proved them wrong by loading 60 tons of materials onto the top of the column before it collapsed. After his demonstration of the column's durability, Wright was given his building permit. After its completion, the Johnson Wax headquarters was magnificent. The building had no windows and was lighted by the spacing between the lily pads from glass tube lighting. Wright had not sealed the ceiling properly, and the roofing would leak when it rained. Wright accepted this flaw because he knew it was a small price to pay for the overall grandiose of the building. In 1959, Frank Lloyd Wright died five days after an operation for an intestinal obstruction. Six months later, on October 21st, 1959, his final work, the Guggenheim Museum, opened to the public. Before his death, he expressed in an interview with Michael Morris, If I had another 15 years to work, I could rebuild this entire country. I could change the nation. Although he passed away, we have been left with the greatest structures ever seen. Wright imprinted the nation with our very first and original American architecture. He was a visionary of his time, and his work has touched people today. Wright and his grand buildings are still revered.